Hello and welcome to this keynote session at the Euromoney Global Borrowers and Bond Investors Forum. It's a real pleasure to be joined today by Jane Ann Gadia. Welcome, Jane Ann, and thank, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Victoria. Um, of course, you'll see Jane Ann's bio on our platform, uh, but I'm going to do a quick rundown of her impressive career thus far. Uh, a chartered accountant, Jane Ann spent six years at Norwich Union before becoming one of the founders of Virgin Direct. She set up Virgin One account, which was acquired by RBS in 2001. Having spent five years at RBS, she returned to Virgin as CEO of Virgin Money. Today, Jane Ann is the founder and executive chair of Snoop. Um, we're gonna be talking a bit about Snoop uh, in due course, but I want to ask a few questions first about your former roles uh, and your former life at RBS and at Virgin. So um, in our conferences, and obviously over the last 15 months, uh, we've been talking a lot about financial disruptors, firms using new technology and thinking, new consumer behavior to challenge the old established banks who are held back by regulation and legacy assets, behaviors, and uh, old technology. Um, but Virgin Money, did this 25 years ago, long before we started using the term uh, disruptor. Um, what made you realize that a diversified conglomerate such as Virgin could challenge established banks? Oh gosh, so that's a big question. So, I mean, 25 years ago, don't forget the internet didn't exist. And so our disruption was on the telephone. We were the second only financial services company to be on the phone. I think Direct Line was the first and, and we were inspired by that. Um, but actually it wasn't the delivery mechanism that was uh, important for us. It was just trying to simplify finance. And my business partner, Rowan Gormley, who um, had, had originally come over from South Africa with a wife and young family, um, met Richard Branson. And while he was talking to Richard about what he might do, um, you know, to develop a business with him, he was trying to set up his finances with this young family and found it completely confusing. So when we met, I was working at Norwich Union at the time, he said to me, why don't we think about how we could make this really simple for people? And of course, simple really meant direct, it meant over the phone, it meant, yeah. you know, no frills products. And, and that's where it all came from, really. So I think it's funny that sometimes disruption, and I think it's true today, is actually simplification. And it can be quite hard to get there, but gosh, it's worth it in the end. Did you even use the term disruption when you were setting up, you know, 25 years ago? Was it even a term then? No. No, definitely not. No. I mean, it was, it was, uh, I think really what, what it was, in a sense, I suppose, I remember um, the people that set it up, there were 14 of us that set it up, Rowan, myself, and then there were 14 people, as I say, that came from Norwich Union. And after we set it up and we were very successful, because we were all you know, not particularly senior at Norwich Union. And I remember the, the, the CEO there uh, said to me, what was it that you saw in those people that meant that they were able to set up Virgin? It's been a success. And I realized that actually we were all the troublemakers in the biggest <laughs> company. You know, we were the people that were going, why else do we do it like this? Yeah. And it was our opportunity to, as I say, simplify things and think a bit differently. But I don't think we were conscious about doing that, really. And it was well received by the British public. I mean, it was a, it was something that they, the public wanted and took up quite quickly. Yeah. So we started off with a product. Um, really, it was the forerunner of uh, today's ISA. It was called a personal yeah. equity plan at the time. And I think, you know, not only did we simplify that product, but because it was simplified, it was more accessible to a much broader um, percentage of the population. You know, previously, investments had been sort of complicated and you had to go and see a broker for them. And lots of people couldn't you know, get their heads around that. And I certainly couldn't. Um, but through simplifying them and talking to people over the telephone about them and, you know, it, it made it much more easy for people to actually buy these products. And I think that's why it was something that people supported, actually, because we gave a much broader range of people the opportunity to invest relatively small sums of money. But we did it quite well. Yeah. Um, let's let's move on to your time at um, RBS. Um, so you had a front row seat to observe the expansion of, of RBS under Fred Goodwin uh, and the good sense to get out before the expansion reached its conclusion. Um, in your book, you wrote about it growing too fast uh, and management losing control. And obviously what's happened is in, in the past, 
But now that we're with COVID and we're facing a new financial crisis, do you believe we've learnt the lessons from our past? Oh, I, th I think we've learned some lessons, <laughs> but you know, as a human race, there's always going to be new mistakes to make and new lessons to learn, I think. Yeah. So, you know, I think from the financial crisis of 2008 and onwards that you describe, I do think the banking sector has learned quite a lot. So there's much more capital in the banking sector, for example. Culture is something that um, regulators, the press and management teams look at. Um, behaviours are important, diversity is important and you know again simplification is important I think. I had a, a chairman um, for a while uh, who was a, a, a famous banker actually, Sir Brian Pittman, and after the crisis he said to me of course we should have all realised there was going to be a problem. People kept talking about creating innovative financial instruments uh, and as soon as you start to talk about things like that you know that it's all going to be overly complicated and be a problem and and I think all of those sort of things really, you know, people are antennae are up and um, we've made some progress I think to move away from that. Um, but equally, I think there'll be new problems for the future. And um, I, I think that we're at the moment, we're at a tipping point between the sort of old ways of banking and financial services yeah. and the new. Uh, as we move to cryptocurrencies, which I think are inevitable, you know, I don't know which way it'll go, but surely it'll go in, in the crypto direction. I don't know specifically how. Um, you know, clearly digital um, and data driven ways of doing banking are really important. I mean, I think it's interesting that so many apps are cutting out the banks themselves and the banks yeah. are becoming more of a technology platform, really, than a customer service platform. Uh, and I think all of that change is dynamic and challenging and exciting and innovative and genuinely puts the customer at the forefront of everyone's mind. Yeah. Um, and the question, I think, will be the, the way I put it is, you know, I think fintech's important. We have to make sure there's enough fin and not too much tech because you have to get banking right really and and we must keep a focus on that and, and looking because we're going to come on later in our chat about looking at diversity and inclusion do you think from a behavioral point of view you know the hubris the macho environment the lack of control do you think that's in the past now or do, do you think we still have an element of that I think we have to work very hard to make sure it's in the past. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, in, in the years that I've been sort of working in, in this sort of area and people have been talking about diversity and inclusion, I've definitely seen lots of improvements, you know. Yeah. So I don't know, let's call it 10 years ago when I, if I was talking about gender and diversity in a boardroom, people would raise their eyebrows and sort of shrug and go, here she goes again. <laughs> um, and now it's something that people actively seek me and others out and say, how can you help us to achieve yeah. this? And I think, you know, just that very simple way of thinking about it, that shows a, a real improvement. The, yeah. the thing, though, that I'm most worried about, I'm, I'm worried about two things. And the first is that I do think that there are um, a, a whole load of very well-intentioned, mainly white men who, you know, have been traditionally running these establishments, who do want to have more diverse teams and, you know, bring in women and ethnic minorities, etc., to their board tables and excos. But there are some organisations, I think, where those leaders that say, you know, of course, it, I'm delighted to have these different people around my table, but I do expect them to behave like me. And, you know, I've yeah. seen that, I've experienced it for myself, I've heard it, women have said to me, you know, this is an organisation where I'm told I can really thrive with gender equality, but it still feels a bit of a boys club, why is that? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I had an example with someone a few years back, and he said to me, Jen, and I, I run a team of 42 people, 21 men and 21 women. I'm brilliant at that gender diversity, but the thing I need you to help me with is why can't I get the women down the pub? And it, for me, that was the archetypal essence of the problem we've still got, which is, you know, it is a step forward to have the right people around the table. But I think we have then have to move to a place where um, there's a general understanding that it's the different views, not just the different people <laughs> that yeah. create a better organisation going forwards. And so I think that's the next step. And then my second worry is, you know, let's make sure we work to be sure that the consequences of the pandemic don't create different inequalities, you know, and that we continue to address um, diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And, you know, I've heard a number of people say, you know, we, we could get to a place where the people that 
continue to work from home feel as if they don't have the same impact as the people that work in the office yeah. and women might work from home than men and does that create a new divide and I think as long as we go into it with our eyes open and try and make sure we don't have that divide then we've got more chance of addressing it but, yeah. but I think we have to do it consciously. Okay I'm going to come come on to a bit more on, on diversity and inclusion uh, shortly but I want to speak first a bit about Snoop. Um, yep. Your app is achieved a huge number of downloads, uh, lots of media attention, which is fantastic. Um, but personal finance is a, is a crowded space um, and mid pandemic is quite an interesting time uh, to launch a new concept. What has differentiated um, what you're doing from all the other money saving apps available out there? Um, I think it's because we are, um... Um, nothing individually that we do is unique, but all of the things we do together is, if that makes sense. So, you know, we're offering um, some of the services that price comparison websites offer so people can switch with us. Okay. We're offering some of the services that money management um, uh, apps offer. So we're using open banking data to help people to see their finances better, for example. Um, we're offering people the opportunity to manage their banking in a much more um, uh, transparent way so for example um, one of the last banks that we linked up with or financial companies we linked up with was Amex and with apologies to Amex because I know the people there and like them you know our customers that have linked to us say that they prefer to see their Amex um, statements through us than through the Amex app for example right. So, so our intention is to bring together, you know, a, a number of financial experiences, help people to see where they spend and then make suggestions as to how they can save. Um, and I would say that it's the totality of the um, offering that we give yeah. to them that is unique in that space. And that's why, we've, as you say, we've had uh, almost a quarter of a million downloads since we launched during the really? pandemic last April, which is fantastic. Yeah. You might have one more shortly. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, my brother-in-law took a while to download it and uh, about a couple of months ago dropped me a note and said, I've downloaded Snoop, it's changed my life. So I said, about time. So perhaps oh. that happened with you as well, Victoria. Yeah, I think you've got a new customer today. <laughs> so so there's one one more to add to that, that uh, huge number of downloads. Um, Business Cloud named you number five in their top 100 fintech disruptors. Do you consider yourself to, to be a disruptor of the traditional banking sector or is the future, and I think you've mentioned it already, the future is to work with the existing banks and financial institutions. I mean, I'm definitely, as a sort of individual, somebody that would prefer, would prefer to work with um, partners rather than against them, if you see what I mean. You're not going to replace Amex, for example. <laughs> not going to replace Amex. But I think that, um, you know, Snoop is built on a whole range of partnerships with, yeah. with people that, you know, organisations that we might see as our competitors. So we have partnerships with banks and price comparison websites and, you know, um, Money Supermarket, for example, are one of our um, supporters. So I think working together to get the best outcome for consumers is um, is the you know what everybody should be aiming for yeah, yeah. The, the area that we have in snoop actually tried to disrupt the most i think is data and so our sort of underpinning disruptive thought at the very beginning of all of this was um, organizations have our consumer data and they use it for their best interests and what snoop does is it tries to make sure that you as a customer provide us with your data in a very controlled and secure way and we use your data for your benefit and you know we, we see that as being particularly disruptive at this time and, and as I say people are certainly on that journey with us. And Snoop you're I mean you're a UK company will you have plans to branch out and go go further afield um, yeah, um definitely i'm yeah. kind of talking about it at the moment but um you know we're very focused on the uk now and we want to make the thing really sing for uk consumers yeah. But it's been fascinating over the last 12 months how much inbound we've had from, um, uh, you know, organisations and, and states, frankly, overseas. Yeah. Um, and Canada and uh, America, for example, are just about to embark on their own version of open banking. So that gives us an opportunity to build there too. So, yeah, um, yeah. We'll be internationally going forward. So countries that are slightly further behind on kind of the open banking data side of things will surely yeah. be looking for these opportunities. Yes. Uh, exciting exciting expansion plans yeah, really. um so let's come on to talk about more about diversity and inclusion um we're focusing on it massively at, at euro money and a, a small plug for our 
uh, inclusivity agenda, which is on our website, on our Euro Money Conferences website. So we have we set targets for conferences, you know, where we have to achieve certain, you know, diversity inclusion targets. So I think you know most companies are are looking at it uh, and and trying to do more. You were the UK government's women in finance champion, I understand, and obviously a long-standing advocate of gender diversity in finance. And we've touched about on this already with the working from home. Um, you know, a lot of us are still working from home. A lot of us will continue working from home. Um, will that have an impact on diversity? And what will that be? Um, you know, and what are the risks uh, that companies can mitigate with the working from home culture? Um, well, I don't have a crystal ball, but I just want to go back to sort of the beginning of your comment about yeah. setting targets for your conferences and uh, where you work. And, and I completely applaud that. And, uh, you know, it's something that people challenge me about a lot. Should we have targets or, you know, is this something that really strains the, old, the thought of diversity? I remember being at a dinner party when we were allowed to do that pre-pandemic. And, you know, it, it really got people hot under the colour, whether or not there should be targets for, for this sort of diversity. My, and where I come at is, wouldn't it be lovely if we didn't have to have targets? But unfortunately, we definitely yeah. do. <laughs> and, and the reason yeah. I know that is that, you know, um, uh, the, the way in which we tried to build the Women in Finance Charter was to think of it as if it were a business issue. And you realise that, you know, in setting up your uh, commercial challenges for the year, there's always a business plan. You report your KPIs, etc. Yeah. And, and so what we said was, let's make diversity targets similar to a KPI for yeah. a business plan. And as people did that and hit them in the same way as they did their commercial targets, well, lo and behold, things changed. And so I think that, um, you know, it, it is important to have targets and to have what gets measured gets done is what we used to say is part of the, the charter. And I think we have to continue to do that. And my view is that it's even more important to do that now post pandemic, because, as I said earlier, I mm -hmm. think that there are given the new ways of working, whether it's, you know, flexibility or um, in terms of hours or flexibility in terms of virtual or um, real appearance at meetings and other important things. I think that there has to be a conscious plan to make sure that we've got the right balance of people that are involved in sessions and that everyone gets heard. I mean, I was at a board meeting in, in person last week where, I don't know, perhaps 70% of the, our board were in person and 30% were on a big screen in the room. And I think that the thing that's odd is the people in the room seem to me to get heard the most. And I think we have to make a real conscious effort to hear the yeah. people that are appearing virtually, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and so that would be my, I think my learnings would say that these things don't just happen by good intentions, however, well-intentioned people are you, you've probably got to manage it and be clear on what you're trying to achieve and, and force that through and then hopefully we'll train behavior so that we don't have to be quite so tight around those targets and measures going forward yeah. at the end of the day surely more women will be able to work because because of the flexibility so the numbers of women you know that that you know with children and juggling these you know incredibly busy lives the, the opportunities will open up and more women will be in the workplace and yeah yes, I, well and and again i hope and believe that to be the case it's really yeah. interesting pre-pandemic when we did the charter and um, we did a big um analysis of what what women wanted in order to stay at work post children really and to, pro to progress in their careers in financial uh, services and a huge proportion said, give me the technology to work from home and be flexible and don't expect that I'm in the office and going down the pub, funny enough, with people at the end of the day. I want to need to be home and look after my kids yeah. or parents or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so this gives those people, I think, the, the opportunity to do that. What we have to make sure is that um, being on technology, as I say, doesn't make anyone either a sort of second class working yeah. citizen, as it were, or um, I, I think we also have to make sure that we're really clear what it means in terms of training and development, because the thing I've been concerned about during all of our working through screens during lockdown is, um, you know, I know that throughout my career, I learnt by watching people through role models. Okay. You know, you think, oh, I, I remember consciously for a while in my career, if ever I had a problem, I'd, I, I'd think, oh, what would so-and-so do in that instance? And it's much harder to do through a screen. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think we have to be careful not to be too transactional and help people to develop professionally through 
um, you know, some form of interaction that's conscious again, rather than just make just ask people to turn up on a screen and, you know, answer the phone or do fill in an application form and not think about their development. So yeah. I think there's a lot of work to do, but if we get it right, I think it'll be brilliant. Yeah, it will. Um, so what at Snoop, obviously, you know, you're you're innovating, disrupting, you know, making things simpler for customers. What are you doing to ensure diversity and inclusion? And and whatever you're doing, is it is it working? Um, I mean, these things are never good enough, I think. Mm -hmm. And so even before Snoop, I remember at Virgin Money, you know, when I started to put my head above the parapet on these sort of issues. The first year that I did that feeling, I need to be really clear at Virgin Money that we're getting it right ourselves. And we had a bonus um, allocation, you know, in January or something. And I remember looking at it as it was broken down and lo and behold, um, more men than women were getting bonuses. And I um, asked the team to do a normal distribution curve of how bonuses were allocated through the different departments for want of a better word and sent them back to the heads of those departments and people were horrified goodness me now how can it possibly be that we've ended up paying men more than women surely we don't behave like that and so you know we haven't always got it right we were able yeah. to adjust it uh, along the way but my point is you know everybody has to hold themselves to the same standards and to measure it and to look to see what's happening we try and do that at snoop um, we tried I've always been a fan of um, what's called blind recruitment lists you know so that you don't you, you look at the skills of the person that you're um, going to recruit you well, do, and then you just don't see uh, the, uh, any info okay. absolutely which has always been really powerful yeah. to try and do that um, everybody I know that this can be something that people love or hate you know everybody goes through their unconscious bias training which I think is really really I personally think is really important whether or not people say this is a sort of woke thing that we shouldn't be doing um, I think it's just something about that it, it, it helps one's self-awareness I think and can be quite shocking and surprising yeah. around your own um, views of, uh, of the world um, I think as well, you know, uh, 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 as well as um, trying to get to a place where those two things mean that we get the best possible people, we're not positively or negatively discriminating, we're just getting the best people. And then we've been trying to focus on how do you help people to manage, you know, the particular circumstances of the last 15 months, yeah. um, but also their own, um, you know, their own lives and challenges in their own lives. And so we've tried to make working life as flexible as possible. We've tried to have a safe environment where people can talk about their own issues when, when they need to. But, you know, I have to say that I do think it's going to be uh, better, really. I don't know why yeah. that. Once we can be back in the office a bit together, have a cup of coffee together and just have a chat. Yeah. Um, because as I said to you personally, before we started this, I just think we're sociable animals. And for me, work is sociable as well as, um, as well as you know work <laughs> yeah absolutely I think you're you're spot on with that and um I've got we've run out, I could talk to you for ages Dana thank you so much um for joining us and and for a fascinating chat um you've got a new customer in Snoop Excellent. I'm going to literally download the app now um thank you so much for joining us uh today thank you to the audience I've forgotten that you're there but thank you to the audience that have joined us um and I think the next session on our agenda will follow shortly thank you Victoria thank you